You're watching The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlemagne the God. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Mo Armour. Did I say it right? No, no Man, you not. nailed it. No, he did He nailed it. He actually, pre- you pronounced it as it's supposed to be pronounced. See? That's not yeah. how you pronounce it. I said Ammer. What do you mean how I pronounce it? You never even heard me pronounce my yes, last name. When? Just now. What? You, just now. You said Ammer. <laughs> yeah, I know. I do that to to help out all of them, but not everybody can be like Ammer all the time. It's Ammer. Mo Ammer. Yeah, it's actually Ammer. If you want to get technical now, you want to get again? on all that. Mo Ammer. Ammer. Do it like he did it. Mo Ammer. No, he said Abra. <laughs> Abra Kadabra. Mo Abra Kadabra. <laughs> no, it's a I. It's a very hard letter to pronounce. You know? Okay. But well, welcome to the show. You Thank know, you, you have a, a special out that ye almost seen. Well, on Netflix, yeah. The Vagabond, I saw a part of it, and then I was trying to get back to it, and my brother changed his Netflix password. That's so. so foul that you have a successful TV, you have a successful radio show, and you can't like have your own Netflix you account. Have your own like Netflix. So I'm gonna be honest. So it's I have like ten dollars. Ne- so there's Netflix. No, it's not. The price went up. Okay. Um, there's Netflix on my phone, on my iPad, and then I have three televisions at home. So that's five, right? You got three televisions and can't pay for Netflix. So yes. I use one of my friend, my friend Janae, I use her password for one of the televisions. Okay. And then for the other four devices, <laughs> I use my brother's. And I guess he had called me and he said, somebody um, logged in in Virginia. Did you give the account to anyone? And I said, absolutely not. I would never do that. So he changed the password, and I don't know what the new password is, so I didn't get to finish watching <laughs> Yeah, the next cut is like, hey, Brittany, you in Virginia right now? Why are you, in, why are you putting me on blast like this? No, no, that's happened. I've been booted out of my own account because my family uses it so much. I'm like, See, man, y'all not going to do this to me today. And you're I'll just a change successful it. comic. Why don't you get them all their own accounts? Why would I? Why would I? Why do I have to provide my own family? I already provide my family with so much stuff. I have to provide them with their own Netflix account. Yeah. This, is, this is your comeback? This is what that's you got? Comeback. That that's is your comeback? comeback? Why don't you just buy all your family vehicles? That's I mean, right. Yeah, okay. I, don't, I would like to one day if I can. Now, you're a good friend of Donnell Rowling's, and he definitely hit all of us up because he was like, you got to get, he's the funniest person. Donnell has never asked us to book anybody on this show before, and he went so super hard. So how are you and Donnell so tight? Um, we started well, I, I, touring with Dave Chappelle. Mm-hmm. That's how uh, I've been, I've done like, I don't know, 600 plus shows with Dave, and and uh, Donnell and I became very, very tight. Very, very tight. Like it we just went hit it off. Way with Donnell too. Yeah, it could. No, the thing is, is that once he found out how many years I have in the game, and and, uh, you know, up there killing it and, and doing my thing on stage. And, and, of course, we have a mutual respect and stand up. When you see somebody else, like, killing it like that, you're like, all right. You know, you got to respect at that you point. You can't beat him, join him. Unless you're a complete asshole. And then you're just like, I don't care how funny he is. You're just a mean person. Then that's different. Who's but, funny? Are you or him? Of course, me, bro. Son, <laughs> all day now. <nah. laughs> you know, the, honestly, bro, he makes me laugh so much, you know. And that's I think that's the part of the mutual respect and the brotherhood that he and I have. Mm-hmm. It's just like, man, we both crack each other up. And it's hilarious. And he he killed me one time. I I can't. I don't even know if I should put this out now or not. Uh-oh. But he already put me on blast. But he was, like, juicing. You guys see you got fresh juice yeah, right here. Juice. We're on tour uh, in upstate New York. And this guy, Donnell, you know how he is, Mr. Chef. I cook everything, son. Oh, I can Lord. make everything. Ha. He's terrible. Ha. Always. Like, he's, he, <laughs> so I was Syracuse with his tour stop. This guy had a fresh juicer, right? And he takes out all the re- leftover vegetables from, like, the green rooms and stuff that he has them in and this, he like, the, and he's making all these juices. <laughs> and I'm such a dumbass, I drink one of them juices. And around 3 o'clock in the morning, like, hit me while we're heading. I forgot what city we were heading you to. You to poo? Yeah, I did. It did. It happened. And uh, it <laughs> happened on the bus, which is a huge no-no yeah, on a tour huge bus. Huge no-no on the tour huge bus. Huge no-no on the bus. But it was like a multi-million dollar bus. <laughs> I was like, this bus has got to be like, okay, right? We're good, right? <laughs> I'm sure we're good. It's been a few. And then, you know. You stunk up the bus. I got caught. Yeah, I got. I just sat there <laughs> when it happened, you sat and on Donnell's the never. What do you mean sat on? T- it's a plush. It's a dope ass bus. What do you mean? What am I supposed dope to do? Ass I don't buses. care. I don't Cover. sit on public toilets. It's what do you mean public toilets? It's our toilet. Yeah, but you don't know what Donnell does or what. All I know is I sprayed it. it was I took care. You know, I have a. You know, we don't have to get into the details of all the courtesy? situation. Did you do a courtesy flush? You know, you're supposed to do the as it's coming out flush at the same. I time. mean, you are wild. She yeah, I, yes, very personal, you are very you personal. Why don't you start out with a Netflix account? We're talking about this. You would ask how many times he wiped to it. Oh my gracious. goodness! Now, would you and Donnell do y'all go back and forth and joke each other with him being black, you being Muslim? Do y'all go back and forth at all? Um, we you can do, be we black have, and Muslim, you know. Yeah, it's true. I guess you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hundred percent. You mean Arab, Muslim, whatever. You just go, just going back and forth, just right. friendly banter. Yeah, of course, bro. He put me on blast with this thing. 
Like, we were on tour, and we had a picture of me, Dave, and Donnell all together because we had to go to uh, Burlington, uh, Vermont, and we had to take a ferry on the way there. Like, so we had this big-ass bus on the ferry, so we were on top. And next thing you know, I look on his Instagram, and he has letter A on me, uh, B on Dave, and then C on him. He's like, one of these motherfuckers took his shit on the bus. <laughs> Guess who? <laughs> and I was like, definitely A, definitely C. I was like, oh no, <laughs> yo, I don't. I try not to mess with Donnell that way, honestly, man. That, he get, he goes in. Oh, he goes but, at all of us all the time. But FYI, when he comes up here, we always mess with him. Yeah. And last time, we always prank him whenever he comes up here, and he Dope. always falls for it. Like every single time, Donnell you, has never not fallen for it. That's hilarious. We do well, he's that like, kind. Of, he's a kid, man. He's like. He's he's the youngest soul I've ever met, for Absolutely. sure. And he gets really sad about it, cause like we pretend that we don't want to interview him. One time he came up here and we didn't laugh at anything he said the whole time. Oh no! And whole he time. was getting oh, so no, upset. Oh no! cold blooded. And he kept trying to do another joke, and we were just like, <laughs> "Oh, you cold blooded." I like nothing that. Worse than not being funny. There's nothing worse than not being funny on on air, like on blast, like that. But he's the I got. I really don't want to mess with Donnell at all, cause I don't have time for it. I mean, that could no, take up has, a whole week. He has time. He has time, he has bro. Memes. He'll make all types of graphics. Yeah, all types. Donnell of, don't play. You know, he does not play, man. I'm telling you, for months, I, like maybe the whole year, we were touring together. Just every once in a while, bam. Uh, there was one flight that they had to turn around because somebody took a crap in the bathroom. Was it was so you? bad. No, nah, it wasn't me. <laughs> it was you. You have no, a history. No, but, but he just. He, history. Oh, now I have a history. You have a history it's of his it. fault to begin with. Why is this getting <laughs> completely overshadowed? The you man don't was go every juicing. Day. What? Yes, I go every. I'm so saying that he had juice. I, I did, but he was juicing fresh fruits and vegetables out of the green room. I knew better. Yeah, I'm such so a dumb So go back. You took a shit on the plane. No, I did not take a shit. You can't. You play too much. You play yeah, too come much. come on. Yeah, come on. Get it together. Now, I'll get you a Netflix account. Vagabond. Why, why is it called Vagabond? The Vagabond is, uh, well, because I was a refugee for many years. Uh, it took me 20 years to get my citizenship, and I traveled the world without a passport. So and you the joke vagabond, about that too. I do a lot. So the vagabond. How do you travel is, the world without a passport? I know. That's why you write an hour about it immediately. That's what you do. Right. <laughs> well, I had a refugee travel document that they uh, give for people who are stateless or people who are seeking asylum. Like all these people that were, unfortunately, tear gas is disgusting to see. But I came over here as an asylee as well. So throughout that whole process, uh, since I'm stateless specifically, they give you a refugee travel document that's only good for a year. And nobody knows what this hell is, what the hell this thing is. Like everywhere I go, I get interrogated or questioned. Uh, Japan is by far like my favorite interrogation I ever had. It was just an hour of them trying to figure out what I did for a living. Mm -hmm. For real, like the whole hour was like, so what is your occupation? I was like, oh, I'm a comedian. Comedian. I was like, yeah, man, I do stand up comedy. Stand up comedy. I was like, yeah, man, I'm a comedian. Comedian. I'm like, am I being roasted right now? What the hell is happening? <laughs> and finally, this dude walks in, this other guy walks in, he's like, don't I say, how did I? To comedian. He goes, oh, yeah, comedian. He's like a Bill Cosby. Like that. I was Whoa. like, oh, no. <laughs> and, and he was like, Bill Cosby. I was like, yeah, finally, you got it. Finally, you got what I do for a living. So that's what got me off was Bill Cosby. Wow. I mean, not literally, but Bill figuratively. That's what, yeah, <laughs> figuratively. That's what got wow. me. Yeah, for real. That's and, and the real story is when he did that, and then he gets real serious. He goes, are you sure you're not here to buy cars to take them back to Iraq to make car bombs? And then he makes, he laughs. like that was his joke. Oh, That was his joke. No, he was for real, oh. bro. He was like, for real. I think that was a thing. Like, I guess terrorists were like flying to Japan and getting cameras and taking them back to Iraq. So after he got through what I actually did for a living, he's like, are you sure you're not taking them back to Iraq to make car bombs? And he has this real sinister laugh. He's like, <laughs> and I had to yell it out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was, like, it was like awful. You had to scream out. Like, yeah, it was, it was yeah. early 2000s. You know, was, that's when that happened. You know, but I would get held everywhere. It must be really difficult for you then, because a lot of people debate about everything that's happening at the border. And some people will say, well, we do have to keep people that are not supposed to be coming over here out of our country. But what they don't understand is that you do have the right to come here to seek asylum. And people who are trying to do that aren't even able to get across the border to do that. And you see women and their kids who are fleeing from something in their country, and they can't even do the process of seeking asylum. So what do you have to say to everybody that looks at what's happening at the border and is like, ha that's right, we got to keep America safe and keep these um, immigrants out? Um, go fuck yourself. That's the best thing mm -hmm. I have to say. I'm sorry. I don't have anything eloquent to say in that situation. If you think that the only, you think that you're keeping our country safe by throwing tear gas at completely innocent women and children, you're just an evil person. Mm -hmm. 
there is a due process. Like they say that you need extreme vetting. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took me 20 years to get my citizenship. This was pre-Trump, pre-everything. And this was when I came to the when I came to the states was October 1990, and it took me until 2019. You know, late so 2019. I'm sorry. Why did it take, take so long? Because it is a grueling process. Right. It already exists there. there. The vetting already exists. They, I mean, there was a lot of things that happened within our paperwork in the beginning, mm -hmm. but it still took 15 years from everything that was straightened out. You know, even when you get your green card. You know, which takes a long time. Like when you're granted asylum, it takes you five years from the time you're granted asylum to get your green card. And once you get your green card, you have to wait another five years before you can apply for citizenship. Technically three months before your five year anniversary of your green card. So there is a long process. Right. If you do anything criminal without, you know, throughout that time you are waiting, even something as small as a misdemeanor or anything like that. You're screwed. It's over. And it's expensive, you know? too. It's extremely process. expensive. It's not cheap. And even the attorneys that you're able to get that work, you know, cheaply and what have you, they have, you know, huge files in front of them. You're not going to get the same service that you will get from, like, an attorney who, you know, that you pay up for. It just doesn't happen. It's not that simple. I don't understand where this is coming from. The only thing that I can think of is... Maybe when they came to America, what they did. Maybe that's what happened. Maybe they're afraid of, you know, they see that. And to, like, to think that there's terrorists with them or what have you. With them, it's just outrageous. And it's just about stirring up their public and their following to continue to uh, to really divert us from what's really going on. Have you had problems uh, since then? Or do you have problems now coming back and forth? Do they stop you, put you to the side? No, thankfully. See, uh, thankfully uh, for capitalism, all you have to do is just uh, sign up for a global entry. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, once yeah. you sign up for global entry, you're not a terrorist anymore. So as long as you give them your $50, $150 now, you are good to go. <laughs> you know, they already had all my fingerprints. They already had everything. So what's the point? So right. once I signed up for that, and I remember when I went in for the interview, um, man, I was the only one left. Everybody else was already gone. There was like another officer around the computer, then another officer around the computer. I'm like, man, what is on my file that doesn't belong on my file? So they took off everything. And thankfully, man, I, was, I'm, I don't deal with that anymore. It was very, very tough. But when I came back the first time with my U.S. passport, I stood there for like a good 30 seconds. It just tells you uh, psychologically how I was trained. I didn't even know. It was deep in my subconscious. Like once he scanned my passport, he was like, all right, you good? I stood there. I'm like, are you, you sure? sure? Yeah. yeah, I was like, for real. It's it's like, mm -hmm. it's crazy how I just stood there. Like, nah, you know, I think you need to do it again. <laughs> he was like, no, you're good. Because I was so scared of anything going wrong with my paperwork that it could result in me, you know, not having this my passport anymore gotcha. so yeah it's very very interesting you also ended up sitting next to eric trump on the plane who's that yeah i did i did <laughs> i did that was a crazy trip yeah i i had a tour in australia and then i stopped um you know i was heading over to the uk to do a tour flying first class, class. <laughs> yeah it was, it was you know you fly enough with the with the airline they hook you up so i i didn't know i was going to get upgraded um i was, it was too late i didn't put my name in long and i was like oh, i'm screwed so i should have known i was because the lady was just so excited you know she was she was i should have known she was probably sitting there like oh eric trump is on my flight okay okay let me take a look at this upgrade list uh <laughs> see who's standing by patient oh muhammad mustafa <laughs> Emma, upgrade is probably what happened like i pulled up she's like guess who's been upgraded she was like so happy i was like yeah okay <laughs> i was thrilled because i just came from australia to new york i mean it's a that's a really long ass trip how long is that flight my God, I had to stop in L.A. and then from L.A. straight there. So you got 14 hours from Sheesh. Australia to L.A. Jeez. And then you got another five. Uh, that's 19. And then I had another six. So you got talking about like 25 hours of travel. So I didn't care. I was just like, you know, I'm just happy to just get upgraded. So at least I can relax the rest of the way. And I get in and I'm walking in and I see this lady just flicking off the seat in front of me. Where I'm headed, by the way. I'm like, why is this white woman mm -hmm. so upset to be in first class? It just, I didn't get it. And then I look over, I was like, oh, damn, Eric Trump, this is wild. You know, I was like, what is going on? He was so, so mad. Huh? I said, he was probably so mad. No, he didn't care. He didn't care at all. I just put my bag up and took a second look to make sure it was him. Then I saw his name on his sweater. I was like, yeah, it's definitely him. I mean, what kind, of, what kind of people walk around with their crest <laughs> on their sweater? It's unbelievable. So I just sat down next to him and I was like, salam alaikum, Eric. What's going on, man? <laughs> I did. I did. I was talking mad shit. It was great. It was great. And then he was just like playing, like, oh, yeah, we do a lot of business in Dubai. I was like, yeah, I'm not from the Emirates. I don't give a shit about no Dubai. <laughs> okay, you do a lot of business. Congratulations. Like, 
I was digging into him. It was it was interesting though. I I took that picture as a funny thing, mm -hmm. and I wanted to just put a funny caption on it. And I for real like told him was like, we're not doing the Muslim ID thing. We're not doing this and that. Like this is all garbage. We're never going to do it. And then I posted it, and I sent it to Dave too. I sent it to Dave before I posted it. He was laughing. I didn't think anything of it. I didn't know what I was going to land. I was going to have like every media outlet reach out to me and text like I couldn't believe. And I was like, what is going on? And he oh, he turned on his phone. Oh, I turned on my phone. We both looked at each other like it was a bad one night stand. Like, <laughs> maybe we shouldn't have done this. Maybe we shouldn't have done this. It was terrible. It was ter I do want to ask all those other people that took those pictures while we were sleeping to put those pictures up, please. <laughs> Stop being a bunch of pussies and you put those pictures up. On him? Nah, 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 nah. He was leaning on me. I, I, was like, oh, I can't really? be the bitch in this scenario. Nah, nah. nah, nah. It was. It, we were both exhausted. He. I was trying to get him. I was trying to get him to have some drinks. I was, I was like, come on, man, have some drinks, man. You know, like. Bill Cosby. Yeah, nah, nah. Stop Bill mentioning Cosby. Bill Cosby, all right? <laughs> Stop mentioning it. No, nah, I was like, man, please, you know, let's uh, let's have some drinks, you know, see what we can get out of this dude. And uh, nah, he he had he two bloody playing. marys and passed out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A bloody mary. Who yeah, two of them. Slugged him back. Kaka. Okay. All right. I don't know who <laughs> chugs Bloody Marys like that, but he does. Now, did you did you have any odd jobs before you became a successful comedian? Um, interesting you say that. I I <laughs> I have, but I've never had a job interview. So I started stand up when I was fourteen. Um, and uh, I've never like Arabs don't do job interviews. They always just know somebody, <laughs> right? So it's just like, hey, your uncle has a friend, you know, like. You got the job. I was like, all right. So I, I was like the Easter Bunny when I was like oh, 14. The Easter Bunny? A Muslim Easter Bunny. I was 14. <laughs> I shouldn't even have the job. They were paying me on the table. Uh, Easter Bunny for who? For At the mall, at the oh, West okay. Oaks Mall in A-Leaf. You was the Easter Bunny at the mall? Yeah, at the mall, at West Oaks Mall. That's funny. At A-Leaf. Bro, it was, it was the best job ever. Like, you, you get paid cash. That? Somewhere. They've got to be somewhere out there for sure. But no business. A 14-year-old should never be the Easter Bunny <laughs> at the mall ever like Why? ever because you play too much i mean it's just like it's i it was way it was way too irresponsible to give me a bunny i feel like i was walking around i was like standing the i, I would just scare kids all the time like, I, I was like the worst easter bunny and then it was like teenagers come to sit on my lap i was like yay you know it's like come on man you should should not have a 14 year old be an easter bunny ever ever um yeah i worked at a Convenience store. I know it's very stereotypical. <laughs> convenience store. Oh, what, man. what store? I did. I did. Cook Road Mini Martin. A Leaf. What's up, Cook Road? Uh, Is that like a bodega? It, it, yeah, sure. Yeah, it was like a bodega. It was like the where I learned all the bad habits. Mm -hmm. It was the worst. <laughs> it was the that's where I sold, you know, because you gotta, you know, I was selling fake Rolexes to drug dealers and stuff like that. <laughs> Who are you? I mean, I didn't know it was gonna be such a successful business <laughs> at first. Uh, but I I would just there was these all these wholesalers around and they would uh they was like, Hey man, that's a dope watch. Oh, these are dope Versace's, and I just put them on, and they would come in and buy, you know. At that time, everybody was doing lean and stuff. I didn't even know what it was. Mm -hmm. you know? So they'd come in, and they were just like, yo, Moda, some dope, you know, sun shades, and, and watch. I'm like, yeah, that's all I got. And uh, and they were like, i buy it off you. It's like, okay. How much uh, would you sell a fake Rolex for around? Did they know it was fake, or did you tell them it was real? Huh? No, they, I always knew they were fake. Yeah. No, did they, they know it was fake? Knew it was no, fake. they knew. Yeah, oh, they, they knew. Okay. They knew. Like, yeah, how yeah, much yeah. is a fake Rolex? I was selling for about 150. Okay. Yeah, I was selling for about 150 in the shades for 120. I was getting them really cheap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I I intent initially wore them just to see what would happen cuz the guy who gave it to me was like, "Yo, check this out." And I was like, <laughs> "Yeah, it's the last ones I got." So I was like, "Oh, I'll just use this all the time to sell them." So when I see somebody walking in who likes to floss, I just put on, you know, <laughs> put on the stuff. And I'm like, "Yeah, last ones I got." And they're like, "Oh, I take them." But I won't say, "I mean, I would sell so much end of the week." I'm a, I don't know if he's around still or not, but he just came in. He was like, man, because everybody was wearing the same shit. You know, I was like, what's up, man? You told me this is the last one. I was like, yeah, well, it was at the time. And I got a new shipment in, so what do you want me to do? And then I just take out. I was like, yeah, but I got this Movado. It's really the only one I got, though. <laughs> and I'd sell that, too. I sold so, I did so well that the owner of the store, who's, who's a friend of my father's before my father passed away, he was just like uh, started setting up a whole case, like you know, a fake Rolex. No, yeah, of like I was like, yo, what are you doing? He was like, what? You know, sell up my shop. You're not even working anymore, and you don't even like give me a cut. It's my store. I was like, oh my god, you're right. It didn't even hit me. I was so young. That you were just. I was 14. I wasn't even 15 yet. I was like, I didn't even hit me. Like, oh, 
this is something you sh- I should have been doing from mm. the get go. You were a natural salesman. Yeah, I was very, 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 well, you have to do what you have to do to survive, you know? It was a very, very difficult neighborhood. Right. When did things start to pop off for you that you were, like, able to leave all of that behind and start making money from comedy? I want to make that clear. That didn't last very long. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it wasn't a long lasting it, was, it wasn't like, yeah, Eight I was years. out in these streets just slanging these Rolexes, <laughs> getting these uh, Colombian Rolexes mm-hmm. and stuff. No, nah, no, nah, it wasn't like that. It was just a very short, it was like a few months where I did that. <laughs> that was and, too long. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was going to say, like, a couple days. Yeah, no, nah, it was a few but man you man, you doing well people keep coming to you and then um i did that but i quit that story it was the worst they didn't have a bathroom for you to shit in it was that you were the worst <laughs> you were the worst i should have never brought up that damn never. story i should have never brought up yeah donnell's gonna be like yeah son yeah i won that's what i wanted you to share uh he's gonna make a meme with all of us and so it's gonna be terrible i already Absolutely. know i already see this meme it's gonna be Absolutely. awful um the question is so i ended up so i ended up getting a job at a flag store actually so my mom flags, <laughs> yeah. flags, the flags. Greatest jobs, man. So Easter mom, Bunny selling Rolex is now flags. I never had like a real, so I never had a job. Like I said, but it would just give me the job. Ended up running this whole flag company myself. The first day, because I kept telling my mom, like, yo, I'm, I'm a comedian, mom. I've been doing stand-up on the side. She didn't even know what comedy was. She was like, what, are you going to be Canadian? What are you talking about? I was like, no, <laughs> comedian, you know? So, so I was reading the paper, the Houston Press in Houston. Um, and, uh, and I look at the back, it said Houston's Funniest Person competition. And that was like my end to the clubs. And I went in and signed up that day and I did decently. You know, I was 17, like I didn't even have a set. I had to write it up real quick. I had to go up and perform it two days later. And then uh, and then I started, I was introduced to the Comedy Showcase, who was, it was owned by uh, Danny Martinez at the time, who was my comedy mentor. And he's the one who took me under his wings. I was 17, he was like, look, I think you're gonna be very, very successful. I've mentored a lot of comedians. I've gone on to really great careers. I think that you're going to be one of those guys. And um, if you listen to me, you're going to do very well. I see you touring all over the world. I see you doing wow. television and this and that. He goes, but don't waste my time. He goes, I'm going to give you everything. I'm going to give you the playbook. If you follow it, you're going to be very successful. And that was really the main turning point. Wow. For somebody with that much experience, somebody who started out with like the Bill Hicks and Sam Kennison's and has all that road experience and owns a club and knows everything from mic technique to you know joke writing to everything else he was uh he was really the the game changer for me in stand up and that was after the first time that you went on stage there at that no i went up so i went up at the laugh stop which is no longer there and then when i was you know that's when i discovered there's open mics okay. you come in every monday you know just started figuring out what the routine was and then somebody told me to go to the comedy showcase and uh, and meet Danny Martinez and that was like the turning point in stand up. So to me, when I was fourteen, my father died, and uh, and I was just like skipping class. I just was like was lost. You know, I go from going to private British English school in Kuwait, we were millionaires, to losing everything overnight. Wow. I didn't know the difference. I was nine. You know, mm-hmm. you don't know how wealthy or whatever. We didn't live like Flossing. We weren't living like that. But to come to to the states where nobody does any research, we move into a really bad neighborhood. You don't know what's going on to losing your father five years later is pretty traumatic. So I just didn't give a damn. I was like, I'm out, you know, I'm Ferris Bueller's day off. I'm selling fake rollers and going to baseball games. You know, that's what I'm gonna do. Mm -hmm. So my teacher, my English teacher was the first one, Miss Broderick, she's the one who, don't you wanna be a comedian? You're skipping class, this and that, you're failing right now, this is terrible. How would your father feel if you don't graduate? And I'm like, oh my God, I'd be the legit, the black sheep of the family. My family's highly educated. This would be really, really bad. And she said, I'll let you do um, I let you do stand up in front of the class if you recite any monologue from Shakespeare, and you can't skip anymore. If you skip, the deal is off. And that's the first that's time I ever did stand up. Yeah, that was really dope. Oh, she changed my life, man. She absolutely changed my that's life. That's why you knew her name. You said Miss Broderick. Shout out to her. <laughs> a shout out to her. I, mm-hmm. I hope to see her. I hope she's. I mean, I've been trying to get a hold of her. What's the Shakespeare monologue you did? I did uh, Othello. To be or not to be. Yeah. That is the. Oh, that's the easy one. Yeah. That I mean, the that's question. the easy go-to one. one. That's the go-to one. That's Whether it's his nobler in the mind. You know the rest? Yeah, I don't know the rest. I don't remember this. But yeah, <laughs> but you own it. I just I know it. how to shit English on the bus, major. right? I love Shakespeare. <laughs> now, how, did you, how did you lose all your money? You said you lost all your money in Kuwait. How did your family lose all their money? Well, coming here. Yeah, for, she said coming <laughs> here. Well, the payoff, son. Very expensive. No, no, nothing like that. So they, um, they meaning like when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, mm-hmm. all the banks shut down. And he also said that the currency was going to be equal to the uh, Iraqi dinar, uh, dinar, excuse me. So all those shut down. Again, I was nine years old, so I don't know all the details of it. I just know that most of the people lost their money when they were there, and then people tried to get that money back, and most of the people didn't. And we got a 
small fraction of it, mm-hmm. like a very small fraction of it, many, many years later. Um, but that's how I know. That's all I know. Yeah, how the does your family feel about you now? They have to be excited to see everything that's happened. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah, specifically my mom. I could care less about the rest of the family. My, I mean, I do care. <laughs> this is my family, obviously. But she's uh, she's the one. You know, she's the one who had me. Like, I don't care what anybody thinks. And my mom was like the biggest thing for me because she was scared for me. Just like, I mean, even if my son told me he wanted to be a stand, I don't have a kid, but I'm saying if I did and he was like, I want to be a comedian, I'd be like, oh, no, <laughs> let me help you out. Because it is a, a difficult um career path but uh but my mom the tipping point for me is when we did radio city music hall last year with dave Mm -hmm. and i did the dates with uh chance and childish gambino and you know john stewart popping in and it was just like trevor nora was one of the nights and it was just like five nights of just it's radio city it's unbelievable so my mom came in on the chance the rapper night and she was like jamming let's you don't even know who chance the rapper is right she's like yeah "Yeah." (laughs) it was great and she saw me go up with like you know with John Stewart, who's like a hero in my family, like right. everybody loves John, and and that was like how we became friends. And when she saw that, that was really like, oh, gotcha. oh, my son is really. Did she seen pictures? She's seen, you know, the stuff. She didn't even know who she, Dave was. You know, like my mom is, all she does is pray. You know, like she just, she's all about, you know, the hereafter. <laughs> That's all my mom is about. Are you going to so, be at Caroline's this weekend? I am. I'm going to have to come check that out because I'm here this weekend. So if you want to go get tickets, you can go to carolines.com. And get tickets there. That's going to be from Thursday through Sunday. What day should it, Are you going, Envy? Uh, I'm going to try to go Friday because, um, yeah, I think Friday I'm going to go because uh, Saturday and Sunday I'm out of town. And Friday I just I wanted to take, bring my daughter for her birthday, which was last mm-hmm. week. And uh, I wasn't sure if I could bring her. But they just told me I can, so we probably cut this part out because she's 18. So I'm gonna bring my daughter with me. Oh so yeah, she good. You don't have to be 21 to go to Caroline. You sure? I'm yeah, positive. it's 18 and up. Oh, so we good money then? Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah she good I'm money. With my daughter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, so I think yeah. I think as long as you, she's with her parents, fine. With you, she's okay. fine. They've yeah. never ID'd me at Caroline's. Like you don't look well, like you're first of all, they know you from here. What planet are you on? Drink some more green juice. Get her some more green juice. I'm well, putting our for... whole bill on Mo when we get to um, Caroline. For no take... problem. I just pass it on to Greg. But here you go, son. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you PR for us, Oh, we thank you for having it. me. And where can people find you online? Just so they can uh, follow Real you. Mo Ammer. Mm-hmm. Uh, Real Mo Ammer. R E A L M O A M E R. Instagram, Twitter, all the same. And Facebook. make sure you check out his Netflix special. I'm going to go and figure out what this password is so I can get back on. The you Vagabond. Can... Vagabond. <laughs> all right. The Vagabond. I can use yours? No, I'm lying. Oh. It's Mo Amar. Ammer. Ammer. Why did you say it right the first time? She messed with you so bad. Amar, you made me Muammar Gaddafi now and everything. (laughs) (laughs) This is terrible. It's the Breakfast Club. Good morning.